everybody. So uh, welcome. We're so happy you're with us. This is session number three, overview of the junior changes uh, in the revised health and physical education curriculum. Uh, we are excited that you're uh, tuning in live or online later when it works best for you. Uh, but before we begin, uh, it's important in our, uh, in our district to provide the traditional territorial, territorial acknowledgement. So we acknowledge that the land on which we are gathered is part of the traditional territory of the Chippewa, Odawa, Potawatomi, and Delaware Nations. So Mary Lynn Anderson from Hi. LKDSB. I'm Ben. Uh, I work for Mary Lynn, and we are so glad that Denise Bell with Ophia is live and on the uh, on the Zoom session with us. So welcome, Denise. I'll stop sharing and get out of your way so you can take it away to all the uh, things that you've got planned for us. Okay. And that means that I will begin sharing. Yep. Fabulous. Your PowerPoint. Okay. Uh, welcome back. We are on uh, three of five. Um, and we will be going over grade four, five, and six, the junior division. And uh, any questions, feel free to ask, chime in whenever you're ready to go. Um, and we're off. So next session will be the intermediate division with an emphasis on gender identity, gender expression, which we have addressed and will continue to address today as well. Um, but just a, a reminder for that. Uh, our learning objectives today, uh, clearer understanding of the sexual health components, uh, increase your confidence in being comfortable with key concepts. So we will be actually going to the OFIA website and looking at that curriculum uh, in this session and in a future session, and then have an awareness of some resources that are affiliated with OFIA um, to help uh, address the changes in the curriculum. So we're gonna go with what has been updated. Some of you are joining us for the first time, so I'll revisit very quickly. Um, the, these are our strands. We talked about the social emotional strand here and how it is the umbrella strand. Ah, go back. How it's the umbrella strand, um, that's what's new. So we talked about creating uh, a community and an inclusive classroom, um, how to be responsible and respectful of others. And so these skills are embedded throughout uh, your active living, your movement competence, and your healthy living strands. Uh, and just finding ways to make sure that you are creating that safe uh, environment for the, the, the students. We then went to uh, our horizontal and vertical learning. So again, um, the horizontal activity is you're teaching grade six individuals only about healthy eating. So you're going across there. What do we need to do? Blank here. We need influences on healthy eating, eating cues and guidelines, and then the benefits of healthy eating. In comparison, you could also do the instruction vertically, and that's making connections and trying to enforce the concept of making healthy choices. Um, and there is a time and a place for both types of learning. Uh, and it's up for the educator to decide, okay, this is what I think will be most beneficial for these students and how they will um, sort of digest the information that we're asking them to share, to comprehend and then share back. Any questions there so far in our recap? Makes sense to me. I love the, uh social and emotional intelligence part. And I love how you show those different pathways through the curriculum, Denise. I think those are great things to point out. Thanks. All right, brilliant. Okay, we continue on. So strand D is the healthy living strand that we're addressing. And the updates uh, revolve around bullying and cyberbullying, which was something that was there before. Uh, in grade four, it's the social emotional learning skills. There's an updated food guide that we talked about as well. Um, there's social emotional learning skills in grade five. And we talked, we talk about self-concept and sexual orientation. 
um, in the Healthy Living Strand for D, uh, Consent. I'll be showing you a little video today um, geared towards the elementary panel. And then uh, for our seven, eight, we have another um, consent video that is it's good for discussion, good for teachers, I think, to be able to sort of bring it to a different lens for students rather than here I'm feeding you information and you are meant to ingest it, but it's another way that they can connect with. Um, we talk about healthy relationships, um, which ties into consent and online safety, the pornography, um, we'll reference a couple of other tools that uh, Ophia visits. Um, and those are the additions as well. So emotional and interpersonal and consent issues for grade five and six. We talked about the school policy last webinar and uh, then and Mary Lynn went through that. Um, I don't think we need to open it again today. Uh, unless you want to share that screen again, Ben? I think we're good for sharing the screen, but we would say that if you go on the LKDSP website and you can find our admin procedures, you'll yep. find all the information that you need, including all the forms and all the supports that are LKDSP focused, uh, which is basically, you know, is in compliance and in alignment with the thinking with a PPM 162. Denise? Yeah, perfect. Thank you for that summary. Uh, so, we also talk about uh, just making sure that you've created that community uh, when you're addressing the human development and sexual health component of the curriculum. And so I'm going to take you to a quick little video about creating a sense of belonging in the classroom. So we used Ophia's fundamental principles for the last two webinars. And there is also another video that addresses this topic, but I just thought this one also captured it. Um, very, very well. Anything else special happen this weekend, friends? In the pool, I did a cannonball. I know how to swim. You know how to swim? I, I know. I do. Bubbles underwater. You Me do. too. As human beings, one of the most essential needs we have is the need to belong. In school, children need a sense of belonging to be able to be productive learners. They need to be connected to their fellow students connected to their teachers, to also be affirmed in who they are in a way that is positive and accepting. In a belonging classroom, there's a community being explicitly built. The teacher knows each child and things about each of those children that they can mention and draw on. I pay attention, I listen. I'm really invested in what they tell me. The students feeling loved, students feeling nurtured, students feeling like they have a place at school, they're safe. It, it activates their brain cells. Sense of belonging is one of the most important activators of a child's engagement in learning. Everything about activating a child's cognitive skills begins with activating their social connectedness. The energy for learning is coming from the social connection that children have. But in the end, we're trying to come up with an agreement. Excellent. We're not gonna come. It was really designed to get them thinking about how they're gonna support each other. I think that reiterating the idea that we're in this together, um, I think some it, it's hard to some team building exercises. At the beginning, we have a community that may meet in classroom meetings to problem solve together, to read stories together, to tell successes and accomplishments or important events together. They celebrate like families do. Things that each other have done or have experienced. Let's talk about what we admire about some of our friends. I admire Jazara because she is so compassionate. And when we're talking about being compassionate and being supportive of one another, it's to build that deeper connection for everyone, just to feel like this is their school family, this is somewhere they're loved, they're nurtured, they're taken care of, they're valued. Okay, so key words there for uh, me were the connection, having people feel valued, and a sense of belonging. 
And I think once that sense of belonging is established, um, then you can really have that personal, um, vulnerable, those conversations that for some students, uh, they, they can't have at home or they don't know how to have them at home. Um, and, and feeling like it's a trusted adult that you can connect with um, allows them to come out and engage in those conversations and having that question box um, available. So the students, you can see, they can see themselves in the classroom, they feel validated through the instructional approaches. Um, and I think it just promotes uh, a place where they won't be uh, sort of teased for whomever or however they, they um, conduct themselves or what their faith or what their uh, home dynamics sort of advocate for. So we're teaching them about the facts. This is what's going to happen to your body. And then when you go home, there may be a value attached to it, but it's not happening here at school. I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah, I love the idea of the belonging. And I, as, as it was say, it being said and about uh, being part of that and how it's an activator for learning. Uh, yes. That really stood out to me, Denise, is that it, it's an activator for this learning of what's happening with human development and sexual uh, you know, health as this goes forward. But it's also just in general, like th those are practices that cross curriculum lines yes. because feeling belonging allows someone to feel activated for all learnings and safety allows someone to take risks and learn new things, Marilyn. Absolutely. That was what hit home with me yeah. too, is, is it isn't just about sexual health, it's actually about your classroom and all your subjects and, and the need for human beings to belong. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. And I think that um, the other point that I wanted to mention around that is it varies on who's uh, delivering the human development and sexual health information. Uh, and when you get to fifth and sixth grade, you do find um, that sometimes you need to have uh, the collegial rep like the collegial sense with between um, all of the individuals because I may only be in there for 40 minutes um, in a 10 day cycle. And how do I develop that rapport with those kids? Um, I need to collaborate with the classroom teacher and the classroom teacher sort of has an opportunity create, to create a really, really great space. And so it might be co-teaching in one instance um, to provide a, a space where the kids know, okay, Ms. Bell, delivered th Ms. Bell delivered this lesson, but I know that I can talk to uh, Mr. Hazard about something else. Um, so I feel like that sense of community, not just in the classroom, but within the school, will help the delivery and the implementation of um, the human development and sexual health curriculum. Um, so we talk about now we have a healthy, happy family at school, <laughs> your school family, um, and including and integrating some gender inclusive approaches. We had a chart for the previous uh, three grades, and here you can see in grade four, five, six. Uh, the grade four, five, six chart here, understanding the health concepts, making healthy choices, and making connections. Puberty is the big... Um, strand for grade four and the social impact. Again, we talked about, uh, at least in the Peel District School Board, we have a variety of cultures and everybody handles um, the changes. Some see it as a rite of passage, some see it as something that's very embarrassing um, and personal hygiene and care differs. So I think having that space for students to understand that we all do things differently, um, but th these are the changes that will occur. Um, grade five, same thing, we continue with the reproductive system. And we can, again, use that language that speaks to uh, bodies, experience, this, um, and then using the, the appropriate vocabulary. And in grade six, uh, sexually explicit media, I will touch on that slightly, but it does tie in with stereotypes and assumptions. Uh, and then we continue with the understanding of puberty changes and how it relates to relationships. So those are all places um, that we could tie in um, gender inclusive approaches. So sexual orientation for grade five, um, gendered behavior versus saying 
boys and girls and boyfriend and girlfriend. Um, we come back and, and we sort of challenge the stereotypes and assumptions. Um, yeah, I, I'll allude to my own example. So not even in grade four and five, but in grade one, um, I had an individual uh, say to me, are you a girl or a boy? <laughs> And I said, well, what makes you think I'm a girl? And then a couple of answers. Well, what makes you think I'm a boy? Well, you don't have earrings and your hair isn't long. You have short hair. Uh, and I had, I had been wearing a sweater with a collared shirt under it or something. So it was pretty androgynous in terms of the attire. Um, but I think it was an opportunity because in uh, a lot of... Um, East Indian cultures, long hair, jewelry um, are very synonymous with the female um, attire. And so depending on whether or not your hair is covered for a male, they do have long hair, um, but it's typically covered. So it was very interesting for me to realize it depends on who you're instructing and being able to make those connections with those kids uh, to challenge some of those stereotypes and assumptions. But it starts even in grade one. <laughs> yeah. So we move into consent. Um, and in grade six, if you go to the curriculum, uh, we went last, um, the first two webinars. I, I, I took some time to go through there. And it's going to be on page 226 and 229. Um, but it will sort of talk about how to interact with individuals and knowing how consent builds um, social emotional learning skills. Um, and it also incorporates our First Nations, Métis and Inuit cultural teachings and medicine wheel teachings um, as a way of talking about self-identity um, and skills that exist. Any questions? I feel like you shared last time about um, bringing in some individuals uh, that shared with, with your class rather than just looking through a textbook. Some of the First Nations, Inuit, Métis, and uh, other outlooks. So you probably have um, more resources than certain areas. You certainly have lots of resources uh, in certain areas. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I think one of the privileges and opportunities we have is with uh, serving for um, four nations, uh, four indigenous nations, uh, where students engage in our system and we engage with them and yeah. elders and and uh, and uh, and knowledge uh, tellers. So there's lots of opportunity for us within that perspective. Mm -hmm. but I think it's also important. I think you bring up some other cultural perceptions and conceptions that are important for us to consider as well. Uh, because, well, we may not have, there may not be the same number uh, within uh, the variety of cultures engaged in our, in our system. It's important that we honor the cultures because we want every single person to feel included, uh, regardless of, of, of numbers. We want that opportunity to go well, and we want people to, like you said, to feel belonging and feel respected and also understand it with, from within their lens, because that's what people bring is their lens to the table. So whether that be uh, an indigenous lens that we can share, or whether that be a cultural lens that has a different perspective than uh, some of the cultural norms. Yeah, that's amazing. We do have uh, exactly the idea that everybody um, has a place, and whether or not that's demonstrated in your circle or sphere, you still want to have an understanding of what is happening in everybody's world. Absolutely. Um, so that being said, um, it's just sort of a great tool <laughs> to get consent in not just a relation, well, it is in a relationship context, um, because even as an educator, I ask the students for consent in many of the ways in which I interact with them. Is it okay if, do you mind if, um, would you be comfortable doing blank? Um, and so I think in the broad, broadest sense, Consent allows uh, students to feel a sense of empowerment, and then it also helps them to realize that it is fundamental to the relationships that they have when they interact with each other, not just um, 
in a, a sexual context. Mm -hmm. So we've got another short video about consent. Um, I like but, that point about consent, not just being in sexual uh, relationships mm -hmm. as well, because I think the building blocks for consent in all aspects may start in other relationships as well. Yes. Yeah. Very um, <laughs> and I uh, was highlighted there that you saw my little person in the screen and even uh, not even at two years of age. Can I have a kiss? No. Um, yeah. So they have a voice and they want their voices to be heard. Totally. For kids, this is you. Okay, it doesn't look exactly like you, but let's say it's you. This is your body, and you get to decide what you do with your body. No one else is entitled to tell you what to do with your body. Not your friends, not strangers, not adults you know. No one is entitled to decide what you do with your body. Except you. That's called bodily autonomy, by the way. <laughs> and that's what consent is all about. Everyone is different. Some people love to hug. And some people hate hugs. And each person gets to decide what they're comfortable with. Can a hug-loving person just start hugging someone at random? Nope. They need consent. How do people know if they have consent? They ask. Would you like a hug? Yes, I would. Can I hold your hand? I'd rather not. Okay. If a person doesn't say yes... Can I hug you? Um, I, uh... Then they haven't given their consent. It's really pretty simple. Ask for consent. Listen to the answer. By the way, if a person bribes someone or threatens someone to say yes, no, thanks. That makes me uncomfortable. I'll just wave goodbye. I was trying to seamlessly go back to the PowerPoint with having that pause. <laughs> <laughs> no success. Okay. Um, are you back to see me? We yeah. see you. We see you. Okay. Okay. All right. So um, what I was going to delete from that video instead of playing the whole thing was just saying, how consent, um, if you're bribing somebody or forcing them to do something and they say yes, that's not actually a valid um, piece of consent from them. Mm -hmm. So um, we're gonna head back to our PowerPoint. So um, I think uh, that's a great place for educators to introduce consent. Um, what is it, what is it not, um, a word bubble, um, when do you think you would be required to, to, to receive consent? Uh, and in the context of human development and sexual health, we would be talking about parties and whatnot for um, the grade six student. Uh, and then some scenarios where you would have to get consent. So some small group activities, this is a great place. Um, you can even integrate your uh, drama um, for some of the, the students or your media literacy in terms of creating advertisement to talk about some of these topics and that way it's not just a direct sit down um, lecture style um, but allowing them to use role play uh, uh, to, to, to demonstrate some of their understanding and how they would respond to some of the situations they could potentially be placed into. Um, and I forgot to mention that uh, edugains or edutopia.org was the site from that previous. Um, the video on belonging? Yes, the video on belonging. So I'm pretty sure I mentioned that somewhere, but not visibly to the rest of you. Okay, so we are back. So Consent, just for grade six, I wanted to share that. Um, I'm gonna come back down quickly to grade four. Uh, so describing the physical changes that occur. Uh, again, one of the ways in which we implement that is through the OFIA lesson plans. Um, I'll 
take you to that specifically afterwards. And um, having a, a question box, I always think is a great thing and where students write, every student writes something on an index card or a, a post-it note. And then the kids say, but I don't have any questions. That's okay, you're going to write a question or comment because when 25 students put something in a box, you don't know who's written what. But if one student puts it in the box, we all know who wrote that question. So it's a way of um, giving them that anonymity and feeling confident that I have these questions and I don't know how to ask it. So we do one whole class and then you can slip something in uh, into the box whenever you get a chance. So I like that method to start with the grade four folks. Um, the teacher prompts are fabulous. Uh, the social emotional expectation, social emotional learning expectations are built in. You see that down there, emotions, coping and relationships. Uh, it's a trying time like most transitions in life, um, teenage, puberty, adult, um, adulthood. So we talk about how the changes happen at different times uh, and some of the feelings you might have and how you can manage them. And that also ties into our mental health, which will be uh, webinar five. In grade five, identify the parts of the reproductive system and describe how the body changes during puberty. So again, this is one of those um, strands where we would really emphasize um, gender neutral language um, and the social emotional learning strands. So individuals who may not be sure of how they feel and how they identify um, in terms of gender identity or anything like that would say, I, I feel safe in this space. Um, teacher isn't putting me in a box and labeling me as this or that. Um, and that's just one strategy through um, the wording in the curriculum and then the resources that Ophia has created to support that. Um, any, any uh, I guess, strategies that you may have used during your times and having to deal with uh, the human I just, development? I, I have a question, Denise. So mm -hmm. when you say um, gender neutral, um, language. Mm -hmm. Do you have any suggestions for folks who are maybe not um, as familiar and uh, like how, how would they, how would they do that? How would they go about doing that in their classroom? Yes. Yeah, so if I'm going to talk about um, the changes that are occurring, um, I could simply uh, go, I say simply, I could go back and I could say, so uh, bodies with penises, tend to experience um, growth with, of hair uh, under the arms and around the genitals without saying that it's boys that experience this change. Um, and it takes a little bit of um, adjusting to, or I can just say people uh, tend to experience and then describing what it is and how the body changes. Is that helpful? That's very helpful. Thank you. Okay. Um, we also talked about the sense of self, uh, sense of identity and belonging, which we are emphasizing a lot, uh, especially during four, five, and six. And then again in seven and eight, um, we'll talk a bit more about that, but even in terms of, of uh, student engagement, it sometimes tends to drop off in that intermediate range. So in four, five, and six, we're really hoping to uh, capture those students and keep them engaged and confident and feeling like they belong and have a place to express themselves. So in grade five, always changing uh, covers uh, the development and it uh, is on teaching tools, ophia.net. And I will go to the Ophia website in a minute, but just wanted to draw your attention to it. So you would order these booklets uh, and you can see that it says a puberty education mm -hmm. and they take forever to arrive is what I feel like. Uh, so that being said, watching these webinars, uh, a teacher next fall who knows that they're doing human development, sexual health 
can go online to the OFIA website, order the resources. Some are downloadable tools that you can use right away. Uh, and some are these booklets that will arrive and the students get to take them home. Uh, I've used them a number of times and it's usually the one thing uh, that students hold on to because it's, it's concrete, it has images, it has explanations. Um, they get to go away in a corner and read it for part of the class and then they can come back and I will discuss it in greater detail with them. Uh, so I think it's a fantastic resource um, to access in addition to some of the lesson plans. And I'll show you where to find that. Okay, in grade six, we're coming back to um, demonstrate an understanding of the impact of viewing sexually explicit media, including pornography. So this is one of the strands that we um, that I alluded to earlier on, uh, in addition to physical changes. And it was something that was difficult. Um, and talking with other educators, how do you introduce it? Where do you draw the line? And without increasing certain stereotypes. Um, and I think these three um, books are really good for minds on ideas or reading centers to get students thinking about it. Um, sort of the puberty, growing up, sex is a funny word, brings to light okay, my body and the things that it can do, and then talking about how it can be portrayed, um, whether it be in a uh, positive or negative light. So trying to have them understand this is who you are, this is your body, and how others may or may not impact that perception of self in, in that realm. So, um, Media Smarts, uh, they have um, an introduction to how to discuss pornography, uh, and they also have some, some lesson plans. But the lesson plans are geared more towards grade nine, 10 students. So I would simply use this as a, a reference in how to discuss sexually explicit media and pornography. Um, and example, how you set boundaries in the classroom. Um, DrawTheLine.ca is also another resource that you can find on the OFIA website. And uh, it talks about, what do you do? You know, it's, everybody's just sending pictures. So it builds in the online, um, online digital citizenship and how, how we should interact. So what are some ways for us to help educate the student um, to set boundaries? Because I know that I use iPads in the classroom and then if somebody's taking pictures and they don't want pictures taken of them, uh, even as simple as do we have a media consent form? So explaining to students that we as educators need permission to take photographs of you. If we don't have permission, then we don't take those photographs. Um, so it's really, again, human development and sexual health is one component but it's an everyday, um, an everyday occurrence. Everybody takes a selfie and then you have someone in the background, but did you get permission to do so? Uh, so those are some of the things in terms of resources that I wanted to speak to quickly. And then I'm gonna take you uh, out so that you can see said resources in action. A good point about images and cameras uh -huh. and as the per, you know cameras are pervasive now in our mm -hmm. in our culture on everything so i think like the explicit teaching and intentional teaching around that is a really great thing for students and for you know where people like you said like setting boundaries as well as for proper use and etiquette when you are taking the picture or the picture being taken of you i do too and and i don't think our kids are gonna. Our kids are not coming into a world where they would understand that at all because everyone's taking pictures all the time without any consideration for that. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. completely, it's um, it is fascinating. It's such a different world. Um, it is, and even with cannabis and vaping, that mm -hmm. I, I hate to go sort of off topic really quickly, but 
it is now, I have friends who are working out and high school students and, oh, I don't, I'm sore from my workout. Well, what should I do? And it's referring to CBD oils and whatever else may be. So the conversation even amongst staff members um, is, is very, very different than it was literally 18 months ago. <laughs> So and Rod brings us back in on the chat saying goes back to permission regarding one's body, right? So yeah. where your own consent is, or where your own comfort and boundaries are, uh, you know, good, good connections all the way around. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, thank you. Um, so I just want to go to that draw the line activity. Um, my bar is getting in the way. I guess we'll start with this one. Um, so here you see the teaching tools and your school board has access to these. Um, I have to reiterate that you will have individual teachers create a login and that way they can access all of these lesson plans um, through Ophia. So I'm on the grade four one. You can see 2019 healthy eating is new, which we discussed in webinar one. Uh, green boxes mean that it's a sort of in development. Um, and then this is the comparison chart of this, what it, this is what it was in 2015, and here it is in 2019, social emotional learning skills. So I really like the upfront chart in within the lesson plans because I can skim and scan and see, oh, okay, it's a B and it's a C, mm -hmm. still similar. It's, it's healthy living. It's a C, it's a D, and mental health. And then down here, you can see the green box surrounded, and I'll have a screen captured image of that. And then here we go to understanding changes at puberty. So teachers will click on this chiclet, and then it will bring them to a list of lessons. You can see the unit overview, get the full unit, or just the resources because you want to include um, a little packet for the kids. So you print the resources out. These are the four five lessons that have to deal with uh, the changes through puberty. So then I clicked on lesson one of four and it brings me to the learning goals, what I need, the materials, minds on, the action, and then how to consolidate or extend the lesson. Further, we talk again about the language of boys and girls, and it's more accurate to talk about the anatomy rather than gender. So you say bodies with or people with when you're talking about the changes in puberty. So there's another example, Mary Lynn, um, of how to address that. People with penises, people with vaginas, and physical characteristics. I think you, uh, earlier on, you also mentioned boyfriend, girlfriend um, language, so where you uh, keep that in a gender sort of free way. How would you word that, um, Denise? Uh, I would talk about um, people that we have relationships with, people that we love, um, people that we feel attracted to, or individuals that we say attracted to. Uh, I know in health and phys ed class, I always used to say, hey, guys, hey, guys. Um, and I think folks um, is another one or whatever it might be. We tend to say it tracks sprinters, bring it in. And that way it's not, not boys and girls, bring it in. It's team. Hey, team. So you can use um, community and give, our, give yourselves a name um, if that's something even in the primary verbs. Turtles, come on in so that it's not boyfriend, girlfriend. And then again, in relationship, uh, I, I refer to my partner rather than saying uh, if it's a husband or a wife. Uh, and that way, it's, it's, it's a way for everyone to feel included. I have friends uh, that say partner when it isn't a same-sex partner, and I have friends that say partner when it's uh, somebody that they're married to, uh, and just choose not to use that language of my, my wife or whomever it may be. Uh, so those are little ways that you can sort of circumvent putting people into those boxes. Yeah, we we um, we were urged at a uh, 
a symposium for principals a few years ago from a speaker to uh, move toward using partner mm -hmm. for all mm -hmm. of us to use partner when referring to our partners. So um, for that exact reason. And I, I, we had an experience at one of the schools I was at with um, a child we believed to be uh, transgendering. And uh, so we had to change the language uh, that was used, um, particularly in gym. Mm -hmm. uh, it seemed to be the bigger issue where we say boys mm -hmm. and girls line up <laughs> and those kinds of things. So the teachers quickly adapted. They did a really, really great job actually of doing that. I was, I was um, completely impressed, but things like if you're born from January to June, line up and <laughs> so you can kind of get half, like just, you know, yep. just different ways to think about it rather than, than using boys and girls. That's awesome. Yes. It's a challenge um, because it's not what we're accustomed to and anything mm -hmm. that is different um, stretches us out of our comfort zone, but we, we are adaptable human beings. And so if we, if we keep trying, we can probably achieve and uh, I think most people want to so I do too and it, I think what happened was it made it easier when they knew it was affecting a child right in mm -hmm. in the classroom as soon as there was a face to this then it 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 was immediately they knew um, yeah. I, I can't speak that way mm -hmm. and I, I need to adjust what how I'm saying things and they did very quickly so that's fantastic um, it's, and I bring you sort of um, right here in that section, so the considerations that mm -hmm. you had, right? Not mm -hmm. everyone is born male or female. Um, and depending on the age categories, uh, I like to speak in terms of athletics in the health and phys ed, and Castor Semenya is a, a big example of someone who you know, how do we talk about trans individuals in sport? So it's really, really good conversation for kids. Um, it's challenging, but it's good conversation. Mm -hmm. So that, um, I think for teachers that are not feeling comfortable yet, these speaking points and considerations are uh, a great place to say, okay, check. My brain is thinking about not just saying boys and girls, but saying bodies or people or individuals. Um, da -da -da. Once you're on the OFIA site, um, there's a sexual violence and prevention resource database. So in the uh, PowerPoint, I also spoke to um, the partnership with some other organizations. Um, so at ways of acting in allyship. So that's a gal which we spoke to, which we spoke about in the last webinar. Draw the line against transphobic violence. So postcards. Um, talks about bystanders and an educator's guide. There are scenarios again, which are important to kind of put yourself in somebody else's shoes. Uh, and then we'll talk about uh, get the facts consent. So that's more for intermediate secondary, but still something that uh, is valuable. So intermediate secondary, and then the fact sheet. So we have those. And here we have the always changing. So it's not, uh, again, you need the log on to access these but you can see it's downloadable. There are some word search activities. This is the updated guide, speaking with vocabulary. Um, and this is for grade five and six. So next class, next class, next webinar, I'll show an example of one of the handouts from the seven, eight version. And this is a male version um, and like a girl, so to speak, but it's kind of hashtag to, um, so that you sort of make those connections. Uh, but this, this booklet is very, very helpful, I found. Another one is Confident Me. Uh, so this is from Dove, but it's geared around self-esteem and it's available in English and French. So that's helpful for, you can see that uh, it's a grade five tool. 
and those would be, I'm gonna stop sharing that screen. And then the last resources resource <laughs> that I wanted to take you to was the Media Smarts page um, that gives you that pornography overview and the impacts on young people. In addition to the draw the line. So in the PowerPoint, I pulled up your peer mentor um, sends you images of a girl you know in her underwear. So this is cyber sensitivity, health and phys ed, and then it ties in the expectations for health and phys ed. And again, you can do the integrated um, curriculum and use drama. The learning goals tied to it, the success criteria, and then how to go through the um, lesson plan for the teacher. So another great resource uh, that's, I mean, it's a lot for teachers sometimes to mm -hmm. search out these resources. And so they're sort they're all compiled on the OFIA website. Um, and then if there are other things that other folks, I would say, sit down and plan together and say, this is what I found, this is what I'm going to use. Uh, do you have anything else that you would suggest? Okay. And I'm back to any questions so far about what I've shared? I think I'm good. No, it's good. I think it's yeah. great to see all the connections and links to other resources mm -hmm. that support beyond the webinar, because we all know that the, you know, it sounds good right now, but when you're in front of a class of students, it's good to have resources and supports that yes. help guide and uh, calm the nerves and show the pathway through, Denise. <laughs> yes. Um, so there it is, and uh, I know it's a webinar, so folks can pause and go through as they, they feel the need. Um, there's the screen capture of the teaching tools, so just a reminder about the box and the charts. And um, I feel like I'm running over time. Things that we discussed, horizontal and vertical learning, the overarching concepts of gender identity and consent, uh, a deeper dive with uh, potential classroom examples and teaching strategies. Again, reminding students that they can pass, they can say, I'm not comfortable, I prefer not to share, they can write things down. Um, and then the, the really big importance of creating the safe classroom for the conversations and that sense of belonging, um, social emotional learning strands. So same resources, uh, just keep putting those up there for folks that they can um, always come back to in any of the webinars that they choose to visit. Um, the blog spot from your elementary program blog um, and a gal in this instance for uh, supporting gender diverse individuals, children. And that's it. I hand it off to. Hand it off. So we will start sharing shortly. Well. So this has been the Denise from Ophia sharing with us, Mary Yes, Lynn. thank you, Denise. <laughs> yes, thank you, Denise. We appreciate you being here for this. It's Always a pleasure. And yeah, feedback, go to the URL on the screen, HPE1LKDSB. But we got to say thanks, Denise. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you. And um, I'll have some more reading resources because I always find those helpful in this area. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Very See cool. you in two weeks. All right. Happy Lord's break. Weeks. All right. <laughs> Bye -bye. <laughs>